Lord our God, by your Holy Spirit, write your commandments upon our hearts and grant us the wisdom and power of the cross so that cleansed from greed and selfishness we may become a living temple of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This was the calling of the day. It was the first, it was the first prayer of this service. And usually, the first prayer always dictates the tenor, the purpose of the service. So, in, in this prayer is very special today because it summarizes it brings together, and brings together the three readings from the Bible that we heard today. And that is not very common. Uh, in the first part, we ask God, grant your commandment, commandments upon our hearts. That is the Exodus reading, the commandments of the Lord. The Ten Commandments, the Ten Directives, or the ten orders that we have received. And, the, and, and what we are asking the Lord is to write those commandments in our heart. I will tell you a story. Um, when my son Mark was about five years old, and parents, we usually, you know, go to our children's um, our children um, room and read something to them, isn't it? A little story, a little book. And Mark at that age had his My First Bible book, the first Bible. And we, you know, read stories from the Bible. And, uh, and one night I asked him, what story of the Bible would you like to hear today? And he said, I want to hear the Ten Commitments story. <laughs> and he said, commitments? I said, do you mean the Ten Commandments? And he looked at me and frowned and said, no, those are commitments. Because we, if God asks us to do something, we have to commit to that. So, I will. And I just look at him and say, hmm, it makes sense. Okay, the Ten Commitments it is. So we read the Ten Commitments. And, um, and I think that that is what we find in, in, in this, uh, uh, the law of the Lord. God is providing us with a, a, a series of statements that we could use as a reference to understand life, to decipher the daily life, somehow to connect and, 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 uh, and use them as a, what the monks they call, use it as a rule of life. Meaning, meaning the point of reference to understand what is happening all around us. So, in the prayer we are asking the Lord to write His commandments upon, or commitments, upon our hearts. Now, on the second part of the prayer, it says, grants us the wisdom and power of the cross. I will repeat. Grants us the wisdom and the power of the cross. Let us take a moment and contemplate that phrase. Wisdom and power of the cross. I think that many of us carry a little cross, a wooden one, a golden one, or, you know. Do you? Raise your hand. Those carrying a little cross, okay? You know, and we have it. We have them at home, you know, sometimes. And here we have it. A, a nice big cross. It is something that provides us identity. It tells us who we are. 
We are Christians. We are followers of Jesus. And it is speaks of what, who we are and what we do. But, I will ask you, what does the cross mean to you? What does the cross mean to you? Or mean to you? I think that the cross represents a very countercultural reality today. Just look at that. And you say, well, you know, it's, this is not an element of an aspiration, but it says something about me. And it is important to define. Our society and our culture doesn't understand the cross. As a matter of fact, I will tell you a true story. Uh, one of our congregations here in the diocese wants to receive a petition, a signed petition from the neighborhood. And they were asking for the church to put down the plus sign on top of the building. <laughs> they didn't connect, you know. It, is a, it was distracting to the neighbors. And um, and it was like a what? And it, yeah, they were not Christians, and uh, and they didn't see the purpose of having that sign up. But once I was listening to a public radio conversation in a Turkish um, American Turkish or uh, Turkish American uh, writer was being interviewed. And, uh, and she was narrating her life, and, um, and in the conversation, she shared with the interviewer that she was she is um, she is of a, a Turkish uh, heritage, but in her household, uh, she grew up with, the, with without any connection with any religious experience. So her parents were not connected with, with any faith, and actually they were declared atheists. So this young woman grew up in that household, and at one point she went to El Salvador. She went to El Salvador and, and spent some time working with poor people there. And as she was getting ready to come back to the States, uh, members of the community offer her some gifts. And among those gifts, she, uh, they offer her uh, a, a, a cross, a beautiful cross, something that looked like this one. You know, have you seen it? You know, the crosses with a lot of colors and designs and beautiful patterns and all of that. And she loved that cross. She loved it and brought her um, back at, um, home. And, um, and as she arrived home, asked the mother if she could hang the cross in some place in the house. And the mother said, yes, of course, it's beautiful. Put it there. So she hanged the cross on one of the walls in the house. That night, the father arrived, and the first thing he noticed was the cross. And then he said, since when do we display instruments of torture in this house? <laughs> that was the only element that, that the cross could communicate to, to that man. <clears throat> to the young woman, the daughter, that communicated the love of the people from El Salvador and an expression of gratitude. For the mother, it was a beautiful expression of art. And I'm telling you these stories because I think that our world has a very hard time connected with the message of the cross. 
It's too challenging. It's too countercultural. It's too hard to recognize that. And I am asking you, what does the cross mean to you? What does the cross mean to you? And that question is especially important during Lent because if we cannot answer that question, it will be kind of difficult to connect with the resurrection of Jesus. During my preparation to the priesthood, I done the Ignatian retreat three times. And that retreat means 30 days of silence and prayer. Hard. 30 days of silence and prayer. <clears throat> and uh, the retreat is divided into uh, four weeks. And for the Jesuits, it's not just a, a week as we understand it, seven days. A week is a, a thematic process that, that someone has to fulfill. But in any case, the first and the second week of the retreat are focused on the life of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the incarnation, the message of love and connection with people, the miracles and all of that. But the third week is about the suffering of Jesus, the passion. And it becomes, as you are connecting with Jesus so deeply in his life and presence in the world, when, when every time when I arrive to the third week, I just couldn't, I just couldn't be a companion of that child suffering Jesus. I found that so hard to swallow. And I say, no, I had to push it to the side. And my spiritual directors always said, if you don't become the companion of the suffering Jesus, you cannot rejoice in his resurrection. And that is exactly how can we connect with the sign of the cross so that we turn it into something meaningful in, in our world. As Paul states, and I paraphrase, we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block for some and a foolishness for others. But to those who are the called, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. And the cross needs to be expressed. Now, going back to our opening prayer and reading the whole statement, cry your commandments upon our hearts and grant us the wisdom and power of the cross. And here comes the application so that Cleanse from greed and selfishness, we may become a living temple of your love. And that is exactly what we encounter in the gospel. Jesus Christ coming to the place where people gather for worship, at the place where people came to reconnect with their faith and give thanks to God. And all of a sudden, he sees that that place has been transformed into something else, a market. And he starts pushing people out and cleaning the space so that the grace of God can be celebrated. And the official religion of the time challenges Jesus, and Jesus confronts that. And in that interaction, Jesus says, you know, 
destroy the temple and I will build it up again in three days. And I think that Jesus is not talking just about the, the, the physical space where people gather. But it is also talking about the holiness of the body, our body, our temple. The place where the Holy Spirit resides. We are the holy temple of God. And God comes with us. And the holiness is to be preserved. And the space is to be honored. And that is, that's the reason why, you know, when we carry the sign of the cross with us, we are placing something that it is reflected much deeper in something that we carry is the holiness of God in us. And you know, I think that that is the invitation that we make to our world. To join us in rediscovering and celebrating the holiness and the wholeness that we have received from God as a blessing. We are in the time of Lent, and in this time of Lent, we are called to invite others to encounter and refresh themselves in the life of God. I would like to share with you a litany, a litany, a litany written by a Kiwi, um, a poet from New Zealand. Um, and it is an invitation. It is an invitation for people to basically find this, the holy space in which they feel whole, where they, they really feel whole. And I will invite you to join me at the end of each paragraph saying, come, come to the feast of life. All together. Come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you who thirst, all you who hunger for the breath of life, all you whose souls cry out of healing. Come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you who are weary. All you who are bowed down with worry. All you who ache with the tiredness of living. Come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you poor. All you who are without food or refuge. All you who go hungry in a fat land, come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you who are bitter, all you whose, whose hopes are tarnished into cynicism, all you who feel betrayed and cannot forgive, come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you who grieve, all you who suffer loss as a fresh knife wound. All you who curse the God you love. Come, come to the peace of life. Come, all you who are sinners. All you who have sold the gift that is within you. All you who toss un uneasily in your bed at night. Come, come to the peace of life. Come, all you who are oppressed, all you who have forgotten the meaning of freedom, all you whose cries cut to the very heart of God. Come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you who are traitors, all you who are who use your wealth and power to crucify God, all you who cannot help yourself. Come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you who are sick, all you whose bodies have failed you, all you who long above all for healing. Come, come to the feast of life. Come, all you who are lost, all you 
who are searched for meaning but cannot find it. All you who have not a place of belonging. Come, come to the feast of our life. The table of Jesus is your place of gathering. Here you are welcome, wanted, loved. Here there is a place, a seat for you.